and welcome to Wisdom 101. My name is Nate Guadani, and my guest today is Sarah Russell. And uh, I'm here in Santa Cruz taking a training uh, with Lee Holden, Qigong, and she's part of the Holden team. And uh, she gave a talk during our training about something called Skills for Change. And I really enjoyed what she had to say, and I thought you would too. So uh, Sarah Russell is a Skills for Change coach, as well as a dance instructor. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. I'm so happy to talk with you. Great. So what is Skills for Change? So Skills for Change starts with the question, can people change? And we believe that they can, mm. if they have the skills and tools and resources to change. And we think people come in with a lot of idealism about what the change process is, mm -hmm. that if they hope for it hard enough, or they guilt themselves enough, or shame and blame themselves enough, that they'll be able to motivate themselves to change. And we're saying, actually, it's like building a muscle, like anything else, mm -hmm. that you need your skills and tools and resources in order to make the changes that you want, in order to shift out of undesirable habits. Got it. Wow. Sounds like a tall order. <laughs> it is. It's, it's an effort-based practice, so this isn't effortless. It takes time it. and it takes energy. Yeah. Um, what are some of the most common things that people would come to a Skills for Change coach trying to change? It's interesting because most of the people that come to me are really chronically depleted. And so sometimes they're not even sure what they want to shift beyond this kind of felt sense in their body of dissatisfaction or longing that they can't quite identify or needing something to be other than what it is, but not quite sure what that is. Mm -hmm. And I'm there to help them decide what it is they want. Got it. So somebody could come to you just sensing that something's off, mm -hmm. something's wrong, or maybe even there's evidence things are just not working, but they don't even know what to change yet. Right. And, um, and so it sounds like you might help them also identify what possibly could be uh, keeping them from feeling fulfilled or happy or satisfied. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And some people really know what their unmet needs are. Some people are in a relationship that's, that's dissatisfying or they want to change their career or they're going through a big life transition and they want to know what's next. Um, but I just hope help add a little bit of clarity about what the first step would be towards making a change. Got it. And when people come to you and they do really know what they want to change, what are some of the like top three or four things that you see? So as far as problems that people come to me with, yeah. usually it has to do with how we communicate with one another. Mm -hmm. um, how we say what we want, how we receive what other people want. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of relationship conflict, and as a relationship anarchist, mm -hmm. what I mean when I say that is not just your intimate partner, but also your parents and your friends and your coworkers. So the way in which we communicate with each other tends to be dissatisfying and not very productive. Mm -hmm. Culturally, we have a very indirect way of talking to one another. Right. We're really resistant to tell people what it is we're really feeling or what it is that we really want. And so I give people the tools in order to do that so that our communication becomes a lot more clear. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's for sure. I mean, I know I, I often beat around the bush or, you know, I'll, I, I'll avoid the conflict or the distress or the fear of backlash or who knows what that, that comes from just being very upfront. Okay. Um, so what are some, what is like the first step? If, if you know that you aren't directing communication or you want to improve that, what are some ways to start improving? The first way that we try to improve that is with self-care, actually. Mm -hmm. So we check in with the person, how depleted are you? How replenished are you? How stressful is your life in general? Mm -hmm. Do you even have the energy to make a change right now? Do you have right. the energy to know it is what you want? So that's step one. And then once we make sure that people are replenished enough, then we start doing optimal life design. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are the negative feelings that you're feeling? What context does that come up in? What are the positive feelings that you would like to shift towards instead? Some people want to be more relaxed and peaceful and calm. Some people want to be more joyous and adventurous. The mm -hmm. strategy that I would have for those two different people would be dramatically different. Right. So you use the term relationship anarchist. Right. So I've never heard that term before, before you, you mentioned it. Uh, what does that mean? So this comes from Andy Norgren. And um, there's a relationship anarchy manifesto that you can look up. And it has a series of principles. Mm. And basically what it is is that we get to design our relationships based on what's optimal for us versus what the culture is telling us, what our family is telling us, what our friends are telling us. We get to find out what our core relationship values are and operate from that standard rather than somebody else's. Right. This is the first thing that comes to mind when I see, um, you know, growing up in the States, you know, it's mm. very easy to see the Disney 
right. and the sitcom version of, of a family and the norms. Um, I just took a trip to Tanzania and um, the Ma uh, not the Maori, the Maasai tribe, um, you know, they'll have, the chief might have five or six wives, um, you know, the roles, the, the work, um, life balance, you know, the, the, the relationships are so different than what I'm used to. It's hard to even comprehend. And um, it's interesting, though, that as soon as I started to realize that there are so many different ways that relationships can be expressed, it almost kind of begs the question. So then, yeah, what do I want in my relationship? Right. Um, what are some of the common things that you see when people start to like have that light bulb that maybe they do have some agency in how their relationships are expressed? So some of the questions we start to ask are, how is it that you want to be relating? So some examples would be like, do you want to cohabitate? And do you want to cohabitate with your intimate partner? Or do you want to cohabitate with your best friend in some kind of platonic relationship? How much face-to-face -face time do you want? What level of physical contact? Is your relationship going to be more of a cooperative teaching partnership? Is there going to be some kind of hierarchy involved? Hmm. So we, we get to determine so many different values within the relationship. Wow. It does sound like anarchy because, I mean, you really are rebelling from religious standards. You know, there's a lot of religions that say, you know, the man is in charge and, right. and what he says is the only way. And, and um, there's, there's, like you said, the... the cohabitation, you know, if, if you're in a relationship but you're not married, are you allowed to be together? So mm -hmm. religion seems to have a big impact. Mm -hmm. Our parents, right, like our models right. from our, our own family seems right. to be a big impact. Um, so how do you start to uncouple those? It sounds like a painful and <laughs> disruptive process. It's, it's very disruptive. Yeah. Change takes more energy than to stay the same. It takes mm -hmm. a lot more energy to subvert the norm than to adhere to it. So again, it's efforting. Mm. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize is we're not saying that any of those models are bad. Yeah. So we're not shaming or blaming any of the traditional models, um, the traditional relationship escalator, um, the idea of a two-parent household, man woman with the two kids, the nuclear family. We're not saying that's bad, we're just saying it's not for everybody. And so normalizing that, that some people want to choose that and that will work, and that for other people that doesn't work and they can choose something else. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to disrupt everything all at once. So right. often we're looking for the micro change. What's one small thing that you can do different, that you can experiment with? Does it feel better? Does it not feel any mm. better? And if it does feel better, then you can keep working with it. What's the next step? So it doesn't have to be a complete abandonment of all normative values. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great advice. It does seem like a slow and steady, uh, it seems like even just analyzing, like you said, like probably just starting with a list and even writing down, yeah, how do I want to habitate, how do I want to make decisions, um, do you have a, like a template, is there like a, you know, a questionnaire? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely I do, um, okay. it really helps it, and what you said is actually one of the most crucial points, it's this ability to observe ourselves, hmm. to notice when it is that we're acting from habit versus acting from choice. So how much consciousness do we have around how we're relating with other people? Mm. And what I mean by consciousness is how much awareness, what are we noticing? How much choice do we have in the moment? Mm. And so that's the very first step. So noticing if you're doing something out of habit or doing something out of choice. And if you're doing something out of habit, is it optimal for you? Mm. Or is there something more? Right. Well, it seems like we do almost everything out of habit. So right, <laughs> then, right. Um, especially with long-term relationships. You know, yeah. like what if you've been in a relationship for 10, 20 years. Right. And maybe you've, you've just accepted that's the way things are. You, you've resigned to it in a way, but you do feel that it's not working and you want to make changes. And it seems like, um, seems like this is obviously easier at the beginning of a relationship where you can come right. in and say, let's compare notes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so what, what happens when you're deeply entrenched and maybe don't have the support of your partner and you're wanting to make changes, what then? Uh, would you suggest? Support's really important. So being able to have some kind of collective, some kind of tribe, some kind of group that you can talk to that's supportive of you going through the change process. Mm -hmm. Also when you're talking to people that you love and you're having these conversations with them, understanding our for the sake of what, of why we're making these changes, of why we're having the conversations, of why we're disrupting something that seems to have been working or is at least well established. Mm -hmm. And always coming back to the connection. And we can say no with love. We can say yes with love, but always having the sense of compassion for self, compassion for other. Mm. We don't need to all of a sudden say that what we've been doing is wrong and shame and blame the other person for wanting things that are different than us. Mm. We talk a lot about dignified differences. Can I have enough spaciousness in my body to want what I want 
and understand what you want? Do you have enough spaciousness in your body to hear what I want while still wanting what you want? Mm. And then we see where the commonalities are, where the gaps are, but we try to do it all in this model of love and respect and compassion, of trying to understand each other's worldviews rather than reject them. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's certainly easier said than done, right? Absolutely, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. Just knowing what we want. I mean, what if we don't even know? I mean, it sounds like you have techniques or, like you said, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the practices? Is it writing? Is it meditation? Is there, like, interactive stuff? What are the skills? Writing is super helpful. Getting your thoughts down on paper helps them complete. Yeah. If we tend to just be thinking, our thoughts link, they loop, mm -hmm. and they can keep cycling, and then we can start spiraling and never get anywhere. It right. won't be productive. But if we can write it down on paper, then there's a finite point to our mm -hmm. thoughts. So they have to complete at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, so writing's super helpful. Yeah. And so getting, getting clear about what you want in a relationship before initiating a change seems to be the best step, or the first step, perhaps, right? Well, yes, absolutely. And when you're figuring out what that is, you're figuring out your core relationship values and standards, mm -hmm. really thinking about it in terms of yourself, and not in terms of other people. Right. So not making somebody else so special that you'll make exceptions about what your core values and standards are. I love you so much that I'm actually going to deviate dramatically from what it is that I want in order to prove to you how much I love you. Mm -hmm. So that when you come forward with your standards, you can go, this is about me. And this is about me offering myself self-love. This isn't about me rejecting you. Mm -hmm. This is just about me upholding what I want and need. Right. This is really difficult, right? Because um, because we are so intertwined, you know, and our identities are so intertwined. Like, for instance, if I if I want to do something for myself, say I want to take time away, mm -hmm. but that distances me from my relationship, right. that that is affecting that person in a way, right? And so, how do we, you know, how do we completely um, be able to stay true to ourselves and at the same time? Um, recognize that we do make an impact on a personal close relationship by our own choices and we balance that one of the ways we do that is by reframing how we define space so yeah. often we see taking space as some kind of punishment or persecuting the other person or as an ending of relating and if we can get out of the fear that every time somebody moves a little bit away from us it doesn't mean the end of the relationship and it doesn't mean that we did something bad it just means that the other person needs to take care of themselves on their own and be in their own person for a while mm -hmm. so if we can reframe that it's super helpful right seems like in a partnership it's probably likely that one partner has more independent strength maybe the other doesn't mm -hmm. and this might be very easy and natural for one of the people but that might require a whole new um, skill set, you know, for the other who maybe they have free time or independence, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Or... I was actually that person in yeah. relating. I was the one that had a hard time with space. I was the one that saw it as punishment, and I was the one that struggled with it, and there was fear and angst and boredom, you know, in space, and how was I going to fill my time? And, you know, we can set ourselves stretch goals if we have enough energy for that. So let's say for me, 48 hours was really easy. So I would get past the point that was easy for me and see if I could stretch into three days. When two days was easy. And then when three days became comfortable, could I stretch into more? And so I, I wasn't, again, doing the change all at once. Like how much spaciousness could I hold? And then pushing that growing edge just enough, faking it till I made it, putting the intention in, and then you know putting the practice in. That was super helpful. And also, this is another really wonderful moment to evaluate what, what we need in that moment, those of us that fear abandonment or rejection or don't like being alone. And what is it that I need in this moment that's not dependent on somebody else? So for me, you know, if that involves um, you know, listening to TED Talks or going out for a walk in the woods or um, you know, like I even have like this wonderful beauty care routine that I do in the morning where I wake up and I spray my face with rose mist and I've got a rose quartz face roller and I'm doing these lovely acts of self-care that are just for me to, to take time in that moment for what I need. And it's a really wonderful time to explore that while at the same time recognizing that you may be experiencing those negative emotions and also needing to have spaciousness for those, that it's not all gonna be fun and play and mm -hmm. relaxation, that there's also gonna be struggling. Right. So some of that, some of that time alone may be enjoyable. You know, cultivating self-care practices, mm -hmm. um, but some of it might be uh, painful self-reflection. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> so, right? absolutely. Yeah. And we're always adding curiosity onto that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm feeling really lonely right now. 
How interesting. Oh, when I feel really lonely, what happens? Oh, my heart feels heavy, and my hands go cold, and my eyes get a little downcast. Oh, how interesting. That's what loneliness, that's the shape my body takes in its loneliness. Mm -hmm. And we're just being curious about what that feels like for us. Right. It seems like in, in dance, and I know certainly in yoga and qigong, you know, people are getting embodied. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're looking face to face. They're spending an hour or more with their own sensations. And often people tell me, you know, emotions come up. Right. They don't understand them. They don't know how to process them. And it seems like this is a wonderful combination where people might be doing the self-care work or the, the practices that are building that self-awareness. And then now what? And it right. sounds like that's kind of where skills for change can give you those skills to Absolutely. change. <laughs> Pretty self-explanatory, I guess. <laughs> that's a good title, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's that's really helpful because um, because sometimes you do you end the yoga class, the dance class, or qigong, and then you're like, uh, something's happening, but what do I do next? Right. Um, so you were talking about having um, you know relationships, people that you can connect with. Um, so what you know? What is a? Uh, what do you do exactly? Like, how does your role fit into that person who's experiencing something they want to change and now is uh, wondering what to do with that? So I try to make myself as much of an ally as possible, mm -hmm. and I come into the coaching session or the relating that we're doing with this idea that you know what you want better than I'm going to know what you want. Mm -hmm. So rather than me telling you what it is that you need to do, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to ask you what it is that you want. And I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to be an ally for you getting that. Mm -hmm. And as you go through that change process and you're figuring out what works for you and what doesn't, you get to reflect feedback to me. Actually, I've changed my mind. I thought I wanted that and I want something completely different now that we've started this work. Or this is really working, can we do more of this? And I'm there in a supportive role. Mm -hmm. How can I support you in the lifestyle that you want to have without putting my own values and judgments on it? Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. And so would people work with you like an in-person, face-to-face, or yeah. online, telephone? All of the above. So okay. I do one-to-one -one work, I do mediation, I do group work, mm -hmm. I do curriculum where I'm just teaching people the skills, I'm also doing cognitive conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I can work with you in person, I can work with you over the phone, we can do Skype, we can do FaceTime, group chats. I make myself available. Nice. Yeah. Um, do you have a, like kind of a, an example of maybe someone you've worked with recently and obviously without you know, revealing names and so forth, what was something that somebody came to you with and how did that process go? How did it unfold for them and for you to facilitate it? Well, one of the most potent interactions that I had recently is we have all these cultural standards about what's normal and what's acceptable. And one of the cultural norms that we have is that we are considered a logical, rational, sane, scientific culture. Mm. And if we come in with any kind of intuition or emotional literacy or kind of a gut feeling knowing that that kind of behavior is labeled as less than mm. or crazy in some way. And so I had a woman come in to me and she was like, I feel like I'm having um, some kind of felt sense about ancestral lineage and trauma that happened with the women before in my family. And I, what I really did was normalize that, not as crazy, but as we have this in our DNA, like we can mark this scientifically now through epigenetics, mm. and what I'm really trying to do is, is normalize people's experiences, explain why it is that they're feeling why they're feeling, rather than telling them they should be feeling something else. Mm. But this idea of, of not having this binary, this dualism, that if you're rational and you're scientific and you're logical, you're sane and you're right, and if you're getting your information in any other way, a felt sense, ancestral knowledge, intuition, mm. that you're crazy or wrong and need to shift. Mm. Like really breaking down and like how we can combine these two when one works better than the other. Mm. Trying to find some kind of, um, trying to find the complexity mm. of it, to be able to hold all of the different pieces. Yeah. And how did that process unfold for this person? What did you help them with and what happened? What I've noticed with this person and with people in general is there's a sense of relief. Mm. When somebody goes, oh, of course you feel that way. Here's why I think that that might be happening for you. Once you normalize somebody's experience, this the sense of release in the body, the de-armoring, the not needing to defend oneself or change oneself, getting out of the fixing, striving body, there's something wrong with me that I need to fix, mm. and going, oh, Oh, of course. This is why that's going on. And the, the release that happens. Got it. You can see that the tension melts out of the body. Sometimes mm. tears spring to the eyes or a smile will lift the corners of the mouth. Right. 
Yeah, because it seems like, you know, there's a lot of that cognitive logical therapy available, and right. that seems to be kind of the only option. Right. And it, it seems like when people have these things, they realize they want to change, and a counselor, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist may only have this very regimented thing. But I think there are a lot of people who are tuned in to their intuition, to their energy, that that's not their language, right? And, right. and so it sounds like that you, you're very comfortable with inviting people who feel like they are able to communicate more in that sense or who are coming to you with issues that are very hard to explain or to analyze. It sounds like you give them perhaps a framework and you have an understanding that this sounds very refreshing and relieving for them. One of the most um, interesting, exciting parts about this practice for me is figuring out how many pieces of information we have. Okay, so I have the facts, that's one piece of information. I have how I feel about it, that's another piece of information. I've got some intuitive hit, that's another information. I've got some kind of spirituality. And, and we gather all of the information and then we make a decision from all of that information that we have rather than just needing to pick and choose one or two. Mm -hmm. We're going, oh, there's all this information and I can make my decision holding all of that. And I find that really exciting to find out like how many pieces of information do we actually have mm -hmm. to choose from. Got it. It sounds like you're, what I sense from you know, talking with you is that you're good at um, taking that amorphous kind of feeling that people have and like you said, putting it into these very succinct um, uh, concepts and ways to, to make sense of it. Um, I, and it sounds like you're saying that when, when that relief happens, is that kind of an ingredient for change to perhaps come to that acceptance and to, to feel comfortable with it? Absolutely. As soon as you can get that spaciousness in the body, that's when the choice maker can come online. Mm -hmm. That's when all of a sudden we have more room to move. Absolutely, spaciousness is huge. Got it. So it seems like we're often trying to make decisions and changes from this kind of confusion and this like I should and, and I, you know, um, everybody else is this way. So without coming to that acceptance or that, like you said, that space where our ability to make choices comes in, it's probably very hard to make change, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, especially satisfactory change. We might be able to shift or move in kind of like a lateral way right. or in some kind of cultural norm way where we're climbing the ladder, but what's the level of satisfaction in that process mm. versus when we're doing it from spaciousness? Yeah, I really liked what, what you did uh, in one of our exercises with um, you know, taking the different parts of our life and and rating them and saying, okay, this is, you know, my health, I'm satisfied, you know, an eight or a nine, but my potential might be a 10. Um, my finances might be a five or a six, my potential might be an eight or a nine, and so forth. And, and then instead of making choices based on potential, like mm -hmm. in America, it's always like, yeah, you know, be your best, right. you know. Um, we all need to be Olympic athletes in every <laughs> field of our lives, right? right? Yeah. But like you said, maybe we're doing just fine in one area. It may not be 100%, but our resources really can't be spread so thin. And so shifting from just what's my potential, which you know, we all have potential everywhere, right? right. Um, to what is my satisfaction. And right. that really helped me actually reprioritize in a very short time to see like, oh, like I'm actually doing pretty good in this area, but here's where I really want to be putting my energy because that's where my satisfaction is. Right. Uh, I find that really useful. It's very, very helpful. It's all about prioritization and um, where we're going to spend our energy. Yeah. I have to quote my lineage in that moment um, yeah. because that language actually comes from my teacher, um, Nancy Chanteau, and she's the lineage holder for Skills for Change. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this language also comes from Julia Kelleher. She um, introduced a lot of this language into the practice. But that being able to make the distinction between satisfaction and potential mm. comes from them. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you had um, provided some resources from nonviolent communication, some mm -hmm. adaptations and stuff. Does right. this have roots in that as well? Or? So we're drawing from a lot of different practices. Um, so we've got some nonviolent communication language, um, Richard Strozzi Heckler, we've got some of his practices. Um, we're pulling from the original radical psychiatrist that came out of a movement in Berkeley, mm -hmm. and the radical psychiatrists were reclaiming the word psychiatry, um, getting it back to its original Greek origins of soul healing. Mm -hmm. So rather than psychiatry having to do with pharmaceuticals, which is the connotation nowadays, yeah. this idea that anybody that's in the business of healing souls gets to reclaim the term psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Got it. And what is, what is the soul? Because that's a little hard to define, right? right? it is. It absolutely is. Yeah. yeah. So what, how would you describe or define the soul? 
So I would be able to give you my definition of it, and then I would also invite everybody else to discover their definition of it, mm -hmm. because as soon as I say what mine is, then people tend to go, oh, you know. They agree or disagree. They agree or disagree. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, for me, I, I really like Dan Siegel's work on mind, and he talks about the mind being both within and between us. And this idea that it's an emergent system, much like the water cycle, where we can be these individual droplets of water, and then we all collect together into the clouds, and we're some kind of collective, and then we rain and we disperse over the land again, collect into bodies, and it's this constant merging and separation. Mm -hmm. And he led a really lovely meditation talking about how we are all part of a fruit salad rather than blended up in a big smoothie. <laughs> and I think of my soul much in the same way. So it's this idea yeah. that it's within and between. And it's this precious vessel that I'm in, this individual body, as well as much like, you know, like the redwood root system connected to everything else. Yeah, so. I like that. So you can kind of have a sense of individuality and agency and choice, yet at the same time feel connected uh, to, to our source and to our future and to each other, it sounds like. Right. Because we're not trying to eradicate ego in this practice, mm. like some of the other spiritual practices, because this isn't necessarily a spiritual practice. It can be, yeah. if you want it to be. But you get to like things, and you get to not like things, and you get to have your wants and needs and desires. We just want to have enough spaciousness that everybody can have those things. Got it. And so, um, what would what would be a, a clue or a cue or like a, a a red flag that like somebody could recognize that this work might be helpful? Like, what would they be feeling or noticing or experiencing? Which would, um, which would really make them most conducive to this type of work? Mm, that's a really great question. So how clear are your boundaries? Is it easy for you to say no when you don't want to do something? Is it easy for you to know what your yes is? Your no often informs your yes. So are you saying yes to things that you want to do? Or are you saying yes to things you don't want to do? Mm. Are you doing more than your share or more than you want? Are you doing less than your share or less than you want? Got it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's that's um, that's easy to identify. So if it's um, if we're compromising our values or we don't know what our values are, um, right. that's probably that's probably going to be a very important signal to notice and to, like you said, start to get involved with some introspection and perhaps some help in Absolutely. identifying that. Absolutely. Um, and so what would be some of the action steps? Like, what are some of the exercises or the things do you do you give like? Um, you know, home practices for people to do? Absolutely. So normally what would happen is we'd start a session. I'd read you some kind of poem to set the tone, or I would lead you through meditation to create more spaciousness in your body. And then I ask you if you could have anything you wanted in the session. If we started from idealism and we're working backwards, if you could ask for your 100%, what would that be? And then that person can tell me, we can do a check-in on what their mood is, what their depletion is. I'll take them through some normalizing of their experience, I'll give them some practices, and then I give homework. Mm -hmm. Okay, so between now and the next time you talk to me, I want you to be able to observe yourself when you get triggered. Mm -hmm. So what's the constellation of sensations in your body when you get triggered? Again, constellation of sensations is Nancy, Nancy Chanteau's language. It's, mm -hmm. it's really effective. Mm -hmm. And um, what are the feelings that you're feeling? Or make a list of your top three priorities where you want to make a change in your life right now or write down all of the negative thoughts that you're thinking about yourself or all of the negative thoughts that you're thinking about somebody else so that we can see where you're shaming and blaming so we can see where there's a life-draining story that we might need to uproot and upgrade to a more life-affirming story. Got it. And so it sounds like with this, uh, with this work, do some people work with you over a couple of sessions and they feel like they experience the change they want and some people may take longer. There may be, like you said, the, uh, an introduction issue and then all of a sudden, now they realize, hey, this actually might help with this and this and this. Mm -hmm. Sounds like um, these could be applicable to a pretty broad spectrum of things people want to change. Absolutely. So yeah, people can come in and go, I'm super stressed about this. I can give them the somatic practice that they can do, and they're like, great, I'm going to do that. And I never see them again. Mm -hmm. There's also this idea that at some point we should be completely mm -hmm. well, and we should be completely fixed, and we shouldn't have problems anymore. <laughs> and my rule is like, I'm, again, I'm an ally. I'm another set of eyes, I'm another brain, I'm another perspective to just add some kind of scaffolding or support to whatever process that you're going through. So you can check in with me as often as you need to. Like if our relationship lasts years, or your, our relationship lasts a day, mm -hmm. it, it's totally dependent on what you need in your life. Got it. How much support do you feel like you want right now? Yeah. 
What are some typical relationships you have? Do people meet check in with you once a week? Are there people who are doing multiple times a week or once a month? The most common I have is once a week. Mm -hmm. That's the most frequent. Every now and then people will do once a month, but mm -hmm. usually it's once a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, is there a place people can find out more about Skills for Change, more about your work as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I highly, highly recommend checking out Nancy Chanteau's website, um, so nancychanteau.com. Okay. Julia Kelleher is another wonderful resource, and the two of them, along with the rest of their collective, wrote a book called Access to Power, mm -hmm. where people can read more information about what our practices are. If you want to find me, um, I'm Be The Radical Way. Mm -hmm. You can find me on Instagram at hashtag Be The Radical Way, and also on Facebook. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to share with people um, before we say goodbye? So the number one thing that I would like to share is that change is really hard, and it takes time, and it takes energy, and it takes effort, and to have so much compassion for yourself for the mistake-making process, that you're not going to get it all right immediately, and just be gracious with yourself like you would to a friend. Be kind. Mm, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And um, like I said, your work is really compelling. And um, I, I think it's going to help a lot of people. I think there are so many people who are falling through the cracks of like the, the mental and the emotional health systems that we have who don't, who don't feel heard and don't feel that their current things are working. And, um, and while this may not be a replacement to everything, it sounds like it could really be an additive as well. It sounds like it could really um, support people in those cracks and in those transformations. And um, it, sounds like, uh, it sounds like it can be really, really powerful. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I really enjoyed talking with you, thanks. Yeah, thank you. We could talk all day, but we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll <laughs> yeah. have to have a part two because I'm right. very curious to go a little deeper. So Great, I can't wait. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for watching, and we'll have the information uh, in the notes so that you can check out the website and the book. So if you want to find more information, please check it out. Thank you.